All right, here we go. Lisa Van Allen, welcome to Vlad TV. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, with the whole, you know, Surviving R. Kelly documentary, you know, everyone has an opinion about what's happening. But I think we're lucky enough to actually have someone here who was in a, a relationship with R. Kelly for, for a number of years. Um, so we're actually going to get a firsthand account of, of the whole story. So I definitely appreciate you coming through. Oh, yes. Thank you for having me. Well, let's go ahead and start from the beginning. So uh, I guess you grew up in Hartford, Connecticut? Well, I was born in Hartford, Connecticut. I didn't, I didn't grow up there. Okay, where'd you end up growing up? In uh, Georgia, in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay, and uh, you were a foster child? Yes. Okay, and what was the whole story about, about you becoming a foster child? Um, my mother was uh, actually a teenager, and um, she and my father separated. She didn't have any money. I ended up in foster care, and um, something happened to where she ended up uh, in jail, and they ended up... Uh, the state got involved and me and my younger brother, he was actually like a new a newborn and I was one years old. And they put us in foster care. Wow. Um, there were no grandparents or anything else like that around to, to help you guys out during that time? I did have, uh, I do have a grandmother, but she was actually working and she had other grandchildren. So it really wasn't a good situation for her at that time to take on her grandchildren. So, and that's how I met my foster mother because she worked with my grandmother and my grandmother introduced her to uh, to me. Okay. Now I've, I've interviewed, uh, you know, people on the show that were foster children. And I think what a lot of people don't realize, and I don't know if this is your case, but you know, they had, you know, I would say how many foster homes were you in? And I'd get these astronomical numbers like 34, you know, 28, like these huge number of, of you know, homes. Was that happening to you or you just had one home? No, it was actually just the one home. I was there from one until I was six years old. That's when I got adopted. But, um, you know, I would have rather had gone to another one because I was um, sexually abused at the foster home. So. Okay. So, so in the foster home, was there two parents or just one? There were two in the beginning and then the foster lady, her husband died. So then it was only her. Okay. So who was actually sexually abusing you? It was a teenage boy that would come over to visit one of the older teenage boys and his and his brother. It was two of them, actually. Oh, wow. So you were, I mean, because you got, you went into a foster home at five years old. I went at one. At one. Okay, I'm sorry. At and I stayed until I was six. Until six. So what ages was this happening? I was about four because I can remember it. So I know I, I couldn't have been too much younger than that. I was about four years old. And any time they would come over, yeah. Okay. That's, but it wasn't right. um, it wasn't intercourse, but it was making me perform sexual acts. I like um, put use Vaseline and, you know, with them. So. OK. Did did the. Uh, the foster, well, I guess at one point it was two parents. Um, did they know about this at all? No, I was told not to tell anyone or they would hurt, you know, the the foster lady and things like, you know, the normal stuff they tell, you tell people, you know, they would say, you know, to scare me. Did you tell anybody? Not at the time. It, it, took, it took me years. Actually, Rob was the first person I told. Wow. So, so you were, you were going through very traumatic experiences. Yes. Early on. Yes. Um, okay. And then at one point you get adopted. Yes. Mm-hmm. During the, the foster time, were you in contact with your real parents at all? My father, no. Um, my uh, birth mother after I was adopted, yes. When I was in adoption, uh, when I was in the foster home, no. I hadn't talked to her. Okay. So you get adopted uh, by a single woman? Yes. Okay. And how was that? It was awesome. Um, that was probably one of the best days of my life. Uh, you know, I can think back to her adopting me and me knowing I didn't have to go back to that place. And um, she was really, really nice. And she, because she wanted children of her own, but she couldn't have kids. So she was, you know, just a great woman and very nurturing and all those things. But, you know, 
things still happen. You know, she couldn't fill the voids of my father not being there, being abused, you know, things like that. Okay. So now you're in a better space with, with this woman. Yes. Um, but you ended up moving out at 16. Yes. Okay. And, you know, why, why was that? You're in a good home. You're safe. You know, it's, you don't have your, you know, biological parents, but you have someone that's actually taking care of you. Why, why leave at that early age? It really was just me being a teenager and her and I going through our own little battles and things like that with me thinking I was older than I was. You know, I'm, if you know anything about teenagers, they think they're grown, you know. So at that time, me and her were struggling, going back and forth. Her mother had just gotten sick and she was dealing with her mother's illness. And, um, you know, we had like a really big argument. And I told her, you know, I want to go live with my aunt. And that's how I ended up going to uh, Minneapolis at 16. Okay. So you moved to Minneapolis and you're living with your aunt. So you're not really on your own like that. You're just with a relative. I was with a relative, but I was very much on my own because she provided shelter. But if she was not home, you couldn't get in the house. And uh, she wasn't buying me any clothing, no uh, feminine products, none of that stuff. So anything you needed, you'd have to get for yourself if you couldn't get in the house. And back then, back in 96, there weren't cell phones. So if I didn't get in and I'm in Minneapolis and it's 20 degrees out outside, I'd catch a bus to someone's house or find somewhere to go, you know, so. Okay. So you're, you're almost like semi-homeless in a, in exactly. a way. Exactly. Yes. Okay. So, so now you're back in a bad situation again. Right. Why not move back home to Atlanta where, you know, you have a loving mother? I didn't want to tell her that I was wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was battling with that as well as, you know, I really couldn't get in the house half the time anyway to call her. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, it was just a rough situation. So a year later, at 17, one of your girlfriends invites you to a video shoot. Yes, it was actually um, her. Her boyfriend was actually my friend. And he asked me to go with her because she was an aspiring singer and he didn't want her to go by herself. So, yes, I went with her as an extra. Right. For the Home Alone R. Kelly video shoot. Yes. OK. Were you an R. Kelly fan at that point? Yes, I was. OK. Like a super fan or just a casual fan? No, not a super fan, just a casual fan. Casual fan. I think we were all casual fans. I was fans. more into Tupac <laughs> at that time. OK. You know, Tupac had just died, so I was dealing with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Tupac died in 96. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I got you. Okay. So you're on this video set for Home Alone, and that's when you and R. Kelly kind of start interacting. Yeah. So explain that whole situation. I was, so I'm at the video shoot, and, um, you know, we're doing our scenes, and one of his cousins came up to me. At the time, I didn't know it was his cousin. He came up to me and said, Rob wants to meet you. I didn't know who Rob was, so I asked him, well, who's Rob? And he was like, um, R. Kelly. Um, I'm like, oh, okay. You know, I didn't think anything of it at the time because I, I know I'm 17 years old. So I'm just thinking, okay, well, maybe he just wants to say hey or, you know, I didn't know what it was. So I get on the golf cart with him. We go over to where he's at, and um, he immediately starts asking me questions. Um, he starts asking me things like, how old are you? I told him 17. He immediately after that asked me, um, will your mother let you come to Chicago? I told him she would. Of course, I didn't ask my mother. Um, he asked me, did I have a boyfriend? I said, no. Um, he asked me about my family structure. Was my father home at home? No, it's just my mom. You know, just questions I feel like now that were questions to where he could see if I could fit into his lifestyle, where he wouldn't get any, you know, like backlash from anyone trying to see where I was or find out what I was doing. But at that time, I just thought he was interested in me. That's why I thought he asked those questions. Okay. And, you know, I did the math. In 1997, when you were 17, he was 30. Right. He was about, yeah, he was 30. Yeah. Born, born in 67. Mm -hmm. uh, so that'd make it 30. And so this was originally in Minneapolis? The video shoot was in yeah. um, uh, Alpharetta, Georgia. Oh, it was in Georgia. Yeah. Okay, so now you're, now you're back in Georgia again. Yeah, okay. mm -hmm. that was after I came back. Oh, so you came back. Okay, got it. You came back, you go to this video shoot, and so you and R. Kelly interact. Um, what happens next after that video shoot? 
after the video shoot, I gave he had given me his phone number at the shoot. I waited about a month to call him. And the reason for that was I was not really sure what to talk to him about. <laughs> I just, I don't know. I just didn't know what to talk to him about. So when I finally called him, uh, I didn't really have to talk to him much at all. When I called him and I explained who I was, Lisa Van Allen from the video shoot, he said, um, when can you get to Chicago? Um, I t told him whenever, you know, whenever he wanted me to come. So the next step was for him to give me, put me in contact with June Brown, which was his assistant. And it still is, a, well, was as, as recently as last year, his assistant. So um, he put me in contact with June. Uh, they sent me money to come up there. They didn't book my travel at that point. And um, they sent me the money, told me what to do to get an ID, um, uh, state ID, where, you know, what airport to go to, where to get the tickets and all that. You know, they coached me through everything to get to Chicago. Once, Okay. Okay. And at this point, you're still 17? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and are you going to school at all or, or no? I was actually working at South Lake Mall. Okay. So you dropped, you dropped out of high school? No. No, I wasn't in school at that time. Oh, okay. Got it. I, you know, I had just came from Minneapolis. I wasn't in school at the mall. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Because you, you're moving around. Got it. And before this point, did you have boyfriends? Were you still a virgin or were you, you know? I've had an, a boyfriend before. At that time, I didn't have one and I wasn't a virgin. I mean, I, no, I wasn't a virgin at the time. Okay. So R. Kelly's people send you this money. You go and book the ticket and go to Chicago. Yes. And what happens during that first trip? Um, Pretty basic stuff. Um, I checked into my he had a, a car pick me up a limo and um i go to my hotel room drop my stuff off um he has june come get me i go to the studio we just sit and listen to music um most of the time we were listening to music in between that he would go play basketball we'd eat um we had sex you know so pretty basic okay so so the first time you had so you had sex on that first trip Yes. Okay. And you were 17. He was 30. Um, is 17 considered legal in, in Illinois or no? I believe so. Okay. So he's technically functioning within within the law at this point. Right. Um, I just don't know what man in his 30s wants a 17-year-old, but you know, yeah. <laughs> no, I feel like... All right. Okay. So you're hanging out on this first trip and, you know, you're around the superstar who has a string of hits and has millions of dollars and, and so forth. Like, how does it feel to be a 17 year old in this type of environment? Uh, it was kind of fun at first because, you know, like you said, he's, um, you know, he's talented, you know, and sitting there listening to his music and him write music. It was, it was, you know, a great, that was a great experience. Um, you know, he pretty much was doing what we were doing, you know, teen, meaning when I say we teenagers at that time would have been doing, going to recreational centers, playing basketball, the mall, rock and roll McDonald's, all the things that kids that age would have been doing, he was doing. So I was enjoying myself up until that point. Okay. So how does the relationship progress from that first trip? Um, he ended up um, having me stay because... I came, I went home, came back another time and he kept making me miss my flight. And I told him, if I keep missing my flight, I'm going to get fired. And he asked me, well, how much do you make? And I told him $300. So he pulled $300 out and gave it to me. And we never discussed me going home again. I just ended up staying up there. Um, that was just pretty much it. Okay. So you end up just basically moving to Chicago. Yep. Definitely. And were you staying in hotels, apartments, his place, what? It would be, his studio is set up like a, apartment rooms. He has beds, TVs, some rooms have showers, refrigerators, things like that. So yeah, we'd be at the studio. He'd be at the studio most of the, most of the time. Um, or you'd be at a really nice hotel or on the tour bus with him. So wherever I'd be, he'd be there, you know, so. That okay, so you were... I guess living in the studio at certain at certain points. Yeah, he was too. Okay. 
I mean, so, he had he had a home, of course, but he wouldn't be he'd be in the studio twenty four seven. Okay, and would you go to his home as well? I have been to his home. Okay, and as you're doing this, well, I guess he was married at the time. Yes, but in the beginning, I I didn't know that in the beginning. Okay, did you find out at some point early on that he's married? Wasn't too early on. It was probably I'm really not sure exactly how long, but I know it was a good while later. And when I found out it wasn't through him, it was a runner actually said your wife's on whatever whatever line she was on. So that's how I found out. Okay. And were there other girls around during during this time? There would be. Sometimes we do threesomes and, you know, there would be other girls involved. In the early stages, you know, were you just completely satisfied with the relationship that you guys had or were you kind of uneasy about the whole thing? I was okay until um, the threesomes became frequent. When he told me the first threesome we had, he told me he had never had one before. So that's how he initiated it. And um, I agreed to it because I felt like he was who he is, a, you know, a, a star. And if he never had a threesome, I felt like that I could do that for him. But um, after we did the threesome, he wanted more threesomes and more threesomes. And that's when it was like, okay, this is getting out of hand. Okay. And you were not bisexual, really, at all? No. Okay, you were just doing it to please I mean, I can appreciate a beautiful woman, but no, I don't want, I don't crave for women, <laughs> you know? Yeah, well, a lot of times women will have threesomes for the right. man, you know, to please the man. That, that's a very, very common thing. Um, okay. And the first threesome you had, was it with an underage girl? No, it wasn't. Okay, so it was a, an older woman. Not older. She was more but my age, probably about age. 17, 18. So she wasn't underage. Okay. At what point would, was the threesome with the underage girl actually happening? Um, I don't know exactly the, the point, but I know uh, it actually happened at his home. And um, uh, it happened at his home, and I was 17 years old. So it wasn't in the very beginning, but it wasn't too long after the first threesome. Okay, now how'd you know the girl was underage? He told me she was six, his 16-year-old neighbor, but I found out two years later that she was actually 14 at the time. Wow, okay. And he was actually filming these threesomes? Yes. Pretty much every, pretty much every threesome he filmed. Okay, because I remember I saw an interview with... Um, the reporter that you know was basically following him the whole time, yeah. the one that he that he mentioned in the in the song, and uh, he was talking about, I guess the wood room is is how you guys described it, Colorado room, Colorado room, and, and what he was saying was that there's actually cameras built into the walls, like like this was a permanent part of the house, and I guess when, when he ended up selling the house, the cameras were still there. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. see, I didn't know that. I know he had like a tripod and the camera set up and the bright lights, so he would do that. Okay. And were you okay with him filming this? I mean, it was uncomfortable, but um, I didn't say don't do it or anything, and it wasn't hidden. Okay. And when he told you this girl's 16, was that bothering you at all? Not cause I, no, because I was 17. So I felt like he said something. He told me something that he knew would be okay because I actually had a homegirl from Chicago that was 16 years old. So, and he knew about her. She would come to the studio. So, Okay. And I guess he kept this bag of, of videotapes like everywhere he went. Yes, he did. He took it everywhere to the gym, to the back to the studio, on the tour bus. Yeah. How many tapes was it? If you were to just guess. I don't know. I saw, it was a lot, though. I mean, think about a Nike big old duffel bag that guys usually take to work out or to the gym. One of those stuffed with VHS tapes. Stuffed with yes. VHS. Well, you're not even talking They're about VHS. They're you're talking long. about mini DVDs. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, they were, were VHS. About mini, mini, oh, the full VHS? Yeah. Oh, so he was transferring them to <laughs> but actual. But stuffed the bag. Oh, so he could, oh, yeah. so he could watch them on his TV. Oh, right. This, he this, was this, putting this them in before, the VCR, uh, and he'd take them out of that big camcorder and put them in the VCR. So... He's confiding in you at this point, and he's telling you about his own sexual abuse. Yes. Okay, so what kind of stuff did he tell you? Um, he told, first thing he confided in me about was about his own sexual abuse. He told me that his sister 
uh, molested him when they were children. She would make him uh, put a pencil in her vagina, um, do oral on him. He would do oral on her, things like that. So that made me really comfortable with talking to him about what happened to me. And, uh, you know, that was like the first initial thing that, that made us kind of bond. You know what I mean? So, yeah, we, we dealt with that. He told me about um, him and uh, Aaliyah, uh, their situation. They had a packed pins and eyeballs, no matter what anyone said, or if anyone stuck pins in their eyeballs, they would never tell about their relationship. Um, th you know, things like that. Okay, so what exactly did he tell you about his relationship with Aaliyah outside of the pins and eyeballs thing? He told me that they were married, that she was pregnant, that they did um, doctor up the uh, marriage certificate so she would say that she was 18, so they could get married. And the reason they got married was because um, he they felt like if he was married to her and if he said he thought that she was 18, that he wouldn't be charged if someone found out she was pregnant until they were able to get the abortion and get it annulled. Okay, because I'd always heard that rumor that R. Kelly married Aaliyah because he had gotten her pregnant. Yep, that's exactly what and, happened. And this came out of his mouth. I like I could take a lie detector test to this. This is what he told me, specifically told me. Okay. I mean, you, you cleared out like a literally a decades old rumor. Right, like, no, it's not a rumor. Anyone actually, it's the truth. Yeah. Yeah. So R. Kelly was having sex with her from like what age? 14, 15? Honestly, I'm not really sure the age, but I definitely know um, when they got married, she was 15. So if she got preg if she was pregnant, I mean, I'm imagining at least 14, you know, so. Okay. So R. Kelly gets Aaliyah pregnant. They try to get married with a fake age. It ultimately gets annulled. Aaliyah never talks about it. Yeah. They stuck to their pack. Yeah. And I remember seeing an interview with Dame Dash, who had dated her, you know, years later, you know, right before she passed. Yeah. And he even said that he had asked her about it once and she said, I don't want to talk about it. And yeah. that was the end of that. So, I mean, she stuck to that. Did you ask him at all why he was having, because he was probably, what, 24, 25 at the time? Like, why yeah. he was having sex with a 14-year-old? Yeah, he was older. I, I never asked him why, I guess, because we were kind of like in a conversation of just confiding in each other. But um, he did get a little more in depth with um, more details about uh, when her mother found out and that her mother, he actually stayed at their home in Detroit and her mother uh, actually was sexually attracted to him as well. And he said when Aaliyah would go to sleep that he would, uh, this, now this is what he said. He said that he would go in the living room and him and her would do sexual acts on the couch while Aaliyah was sleeping in the bedroom. R. Kelly was having sex with Aaliyah and her mother at the same time? That's I mean, not he, the exact same time, but that's the what same he said. time frame? That's what he says. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so maybe this is why Aaliyah's parents have never spoken out themselves. Makes sense to me. Okay. Wow, this is this is something I've never heard before. Right. Me, I did, hey, came from his mouth. <laughs> okay. And, uh... I mean, you're 17 at the time, so I guess it didn't really yeah, I just was bother like, you. Other than like, wow. Really what was like, wow for me was the mother, you know, when he said that. And then, you know, at this right now, you know, we don't know what's true about what he says, but that's just what he said. So, you know. So you're back in a relationship with R. Kelly and I mean, he's essentially supporting you and your daughter now. Yes. At what point did you start going through his tapes and, and start finding some of the various tapes? That was back in either 99 or 2000. So that was before you actually moved? Yes. And, and came back? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because at what at one point, you actually started taking some of the tapes. I just took one. You took one? Mm hmm Okay. The and one I was that actually, you were in? Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was in multiple, in. but I found that I just ran across one that I was in. Okay. Um, and why did you take that one particular tape when there's a whole bunch of tapes with you? It's just the only one I was able to run into at that moment. If I, if I, if I would have seen more with me on them, I would have took those two. Okay. And the tape that ultimately 
you know, came out in court later. Uh, was that one of the tapes that you saw during that time? No, the one that came out in court is not the the people on the tape. I I recognize them, but no, that wasn't one of the tapes that I looked at. Okay, I mean the, you know, and we'll, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But you know, in that particular tape, there was like urination and, right. and stuff like that. Were you doing any of that stuff with him yourself or no? No. He actually did uh, ask me about urinating on me, on my butt. And I told him, I, I didn't tell him anything. Actually, I just l- kind of laughed it off and was like, oh, you know, kind of like that. So he has a way of kind of fishing for what he can and can't do and to you and things like that. So when he saw that I didn't just right away agree with it, then he knew that that wasn't nothing I was interested in doing. So it never came up again. Okay. But you went ahead and, and stole this tape, and then you gave it to one of his artists? Yes. Can you say who that was? Yeah, his name was Keith. It was uh, when he was in his group talent. It was actually, he was a, he, he, they became friends of mine because they were staying in one of the same hotels that I had a room in. And Rob would give them only $25 to eat with. This is what they told me. And um, they would see me ordering all this room service and stuff. Like if they walk by the hallway and see my trays, you know, out in the hall and stuff. And um, they were, you know, I said, well, I can order y'all food. So that's how we got cool. So I would just order them food all the time. And, you know, that's how we became cool. Okay. So now you have this tape. You gave it to, to one of his artists to hold. And this is before the the charges and everything? Yes. Well, he had a, yeah, actually it was, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Okay. And at one point he finds out that you took that tape. Yeah, he did. He found okay. out. And, and how did that go? That was in 2007. Yeah, he found out about it. And um, he actually asked me to come to Chicago. And I, I came to Chicago. We talked about it. He asked me, did I think I could get possession of it? And I told him I did. And I actually um, spoke with Keith and got him to come to Chicago with the tape. Okay. So I guess Kelly's lawyers said that you try to get $300,000 for that tape. Yeah, no. We didn't try to get any, anything for anything. Okay, no, so he actually... No, there- no, he gave, he did give them money for the tape, but he gave them, it was he, his idea. He said, I will give you 250000 for the tape. So it wasn't, they didn't say, oh, if you give me, you know, I have this and if you want it, you get, no. They didn't even want to deal with him. They didn't want to talk to him. They didn't want to give him the tape, nothing. So no, it wasn't anything like that. Okay, but you just offered him a quarter million dollars. So, yeah, he did. He offered them, but they'd be, a, I mean, wouldn't you take it if somebody offered you some money? I mean, yeah, I mean, no, that's I, not I, blackmail I, if you offered it, you know? <laughs> okay. And so, were, you, were you involved in that financial transaction? Did you get part of that money? I was involved in it, yes, because I was the one who had to convince them to come. I was the one who had to be go get the lie detector test done, things like that. So, yes, I was. Okay. And can you say how much you got out of that? Um, It ended up being... Because it was several trips, I had to take a hundred thousand. Okay, so you got a hundred, and Keith got one hundred fifty. No, he got, he ended up with a uh, hundred as well. Okay. Fifty never that never came for no one. Okay, so each each of you got a hundred thousand. In the end, yeah. In the end, now at this point, you know, are you and R. Kelly kind of enemies from that whole you know transaction? Oh, we weren't until um, until uh, Daryl McDavid threatened my life and said okay. that we should have murked you from the beginning. And who was that? Daryl McDavid. He was his accountant slash manager at the time. Okay, so he threatened to kill you over that. Yeah. Did anything actually happen? What do you mean? What do you mean? Like, I mean, were were you roughed up? Were did people show up at your house, or was it just kind of I'm, just a a vocal threat? Yeah, it was just a vocal threat. It was a vocal, but that's all I need. I don't know. I mean, I'm not gonna call his bluff. Okay. So you guys gave him that tape back. Did um, did Keith make copies of it before giving it back? They did. That's why um, 
we ended up having to come back multiple times because when we took the lie detector test the first time, he failed. When oh. The question was, were there more copies? And he, I guess he said no, and there were. So that was a whole nother trip to come back. Yeah. Wow. Oh, okay. <laughs> A lot of detector tests for a, a transaction. I guess when you're talking about this type of thing, then yeah, you got to cover your bases. Right. Okay. So that tape gets back to R. Kelly and the copies get destroyed. Does that tape ever surface or come out afterwards or no? Um, I'm really not sure at this point. I mean, there's some things floating around. We're really not sure what it is at the moment right now. So I really can't say Honestly, I'm still okay. we're still trying to get to the bottom of some stuff. The the other sex tape comes out. And I remember there was initially some news about it and I think Wendy Williams was on the radio saying that she'd seen it and she was describing it and so forth. And then I remember I was living in Oakland at the time and I go to the swap meet and there it is. Like literally like, you know, 30 copies laid out on someone's uh, blanket, you know, being sold right? L like, like a, like a Friday bootleg basically. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I remember, you know, I, I, you know, seen some, some footage from that just to see if it was R Kelly. And I'm like, Oh, okay. That's definitely R Kelly. Right. <laughs> and it was in that Colorado room that we had talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was with a girl that looked very, very young. Yeah. And uh, Sparkle claimed that was her niece. Have you ever, ever seen that girl before? Yes. That's uh, the girl he said that was 16. That was his neighbor. So That's... this is a girl you did a threesome with? Yes, that he lied and said was his neighbor originally. That's what, he's... That's what he told me. You know, and th and this story gets very, very kind of fuzzy in terms of that because that Sparkle's niece, but Sparkle's brother, I guess, played bass on R. Kelly's albums. Yes, he's the uh, lead guitarist for a lot of his um, albums. Like you can Google it and look on just Google Greg Lanfair. That's his name, and it'll kind of show you what songs he's lead guitarist for. Okay. And was that his daughter or another, yeah. another, no, that was his daughter. daughter. And after the trial, he still did stuff with him. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just trying to get my head right. around this. So, so, <laughs> you know, here, here you are, you're a father right. and you're working for this guy and he's, he's paying you to do this, you know, this thing you're passionate about music. Mm -hmm. He ends up having sex with your daughter and then you continue to work with him afterwards. Right. And he lied under oath because he said it wasn't her, but while he was saying it wasn't her, he was crying. That's what prosecution told me. Wow. You're watching the tape of your daughter getting peed on and you're crying and you're saying it's not her, but you're crying. Right. And in that tape, that's where the peeing, you know, the one that went to happens. trial, yes. Okay. Now, the, the Sparkle story is kind of interesting as well um, because I had interviewed uh, two of the members of Public Announcement. And I don't know if you saw that uh, the yeah. interview or not. Uh, but what a lot of people didn't realize was the third member of Public Announcement was this guy named Earl. Were you around Earl at all or no? No. I did see the other guy, though. Um, What's his name? Dre, I think. Dre, Dre and Ricky. Yeah, Dre. He yeah. would be around Rob a lot. Okay. Well, Earl told one of the, you know, the other public announcement guys that he had seen R. Kelly have sex with Aaliyah, and he left the group because of that. Now, from what I understand, Earl Robinson did see some stuff between R. Kelly and Aaliyah. Yeah, he'd say he did. Okay. That's what he said. He told me that. So what did Earl tell you exactly? He said he saw uh, Rob and Aaliyah on the back of the bus. Having sex? Yeah. Did Earl leave the group because of that Aaliyah situation? Yes. That's exactly why he left. 
probably wasn't even a day or two after he told me that he was gone. Mm -hmm. But then Earl was married to Sparkle. Right. And brought Sparkle to R. Kelly to produce her album. Because me and Earl worked on her demo. Got it. It was hot. And Earl says to me, he says, hey, take this to Kale's. I'm like, not a good idea. I said, it's not a good idea. And he was like, yes, it is. You know, I'm married to her. It's, it's good. So I said, okay. So I took the demo down there. He listened to it. He said, oh, man, it's hot. Yeah. But I'm going to have to do this myself. He said, I, he, and I was like, what do you mean? He's like, I'm going to have to produce this all myself and write it. He said, y'all did some good work, but I'm going to do this on my own. So he said, you know, I'll do this, but, you know, it's going to have to be no Earl, no nothing. She's going to have to come down here if she want an album done. She's going to have to sleep on this studio couch for 30 days, and that's the only way I'm doing it. And she never came back. Right. And, and the question is... After seeing R. Kelly have sex with a teenager, why would you bring your wife to to work with R. Kelly by herself and, and leave her there? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, that baffles me as well. I don't know. I couldn't answer that one for him. I wouldn't want my wife anywhere around him. Honestly. That's what I'm saying. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like that was a bad call. But I mean, I guess at least he got to see, you know, what kind of wife I guess he has, I guess. <laughs> Because shouldn't nobody honestly be able to take your woman, you know, so. Well, were you around Sparkle as well? <laughs> were you around Sparkle as well? No, no. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so so that whole family, that there's some real crazy shit yeah. really, really kind of going on, you know, with money and fame involved. It, it seems <laughs> like yeah. everything else kind of goes out the window. Right, Adam. Yeah. So then this tape comes out. And, you know, you, you recognize the girl as, as you know, the, the girl that you had the, the threesome with, who is, you know, Sparkle says that's her niece. A bunch of her schoolmates are saying, yes, that's who, who we say it is. We played basketball with her, everything else like that. And R. Kelly gets arrested for, I guess, child pornography. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And... Well, the trial doesn't start for like what seven years or something, like some yeah, huge amount of time. Yeah, I think it was six. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he pushed that trial back like he did. no one I've ever seen. Right. And uh, and during the time, he became bigger and bigger. I feel like his biggest songs were dropped during that six year era, like yeah. the Chocolate Factory, <laughs> and you know, uh, I believe I Could Fly came out during the time and. Um, I think that was in the 90s, like the late 90s, okay. but yeah, still. You but know. anyways, <laughs> Step in the Name of Love right, right. And, and all mm -hmm. that, that was coming out during during that era. Yes. Now, the trial begins and you actually are involved in the trial. Right. Okay, so what did they, you know, what is your involvement in that trial? Um, pretty much I just had to identify the people on the tape. Um, I was able to identify them because... I've had a uh, threesome with the both of them. So that was pretty much my my role. When you say the both of them, there were two girls in the tape? No, Rob and Roshona. Oh. Yes. Okay, got it. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> well, because I had heard that when uh, the Chicago newspaper got the tape, there were like multiple tapes, multiple girls and, and so forth. There was a, a series, there was more than one tape. Well, and, uh, are we talking about trial? The trial from two thousand and eight. Yeah, see, that's the part I'm not sure because they almost <laughs> made describe like there were there were multiple tapes, but I guess only one particular scene made it to trial. Um, I know the other tapes were in Florida. Remember, they ended up throwing it out because I guess the way they got the tapes. Mm, okay. So yeah, got it. Right. Okay. Got it. Okay. That that's that's what I'm confusing it with. Yeah, because there were other tapes. So this whole trial happens, and you took the stand and everything. Yes. I testified okay. for three hours. Okay. At some point, did you say, okay, you know, yes, I don't agree with 
the things that R. Kelly has done, but he's also done a lot of good things for me along the way, and I'm not going to participate in this trial. Was that ever a thought? No, because they threatened my life. So that is what I was thinking about at that point. You know, okay. um, if you're talking about killing me, um, everything else is off the table. I mean, you know, I was concerned with him getting better. I was concerned with him getting help. You know, I was a great friend to him and a uh, lover at the time when we were in a sexual relationship. But at the time, once you come to a point where your team is talking about killing me, uh, I think it's safe to say I shouldn't be trying to help you change and get better. I think at that point, I should be more concerned with my well-being and the other young ladies that you've been dealing with. Okay. Well, you took the stand and a lot of people took the stand in the yeah. process. Did did the girls, the, the girl on the tape, did she or her family take the stand at all? They didn't during trial. Beforehand, they had like that uh, hearing beforehand where that's when I said, you know, the father said it wasn't her. She said it wasn't her. You know, they did that. But no, not during trial. Okay. So her whole family denied it. Just the immediate. Because Sparkle said it was her. So Right. So her, well, the actual girl denied it was her. Right. Her mother and her father both denied it. Yes. And but, but, let me put out there that her mother and father were actually on a, a, a vacation while trial was going on. Oh, to avoid them taking a stand. <laughs> right. And g getting subpoenaed. Yes. And okay. in a whole other country, right? <laughs> I mean, did you hear of any payouts or anything else like that going to the family? I've heard. Mm -hmm. The pretty okay, much the, you... the 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 typical payout that he does, mm -hmm. which is what a quarter million. Yep. Okay. Well, they go through this whole trial, and he's found not guilty. Yes. Which which everyone was completely shocked. Actually, I wasn't. Really. I wasn't. Well, why and is that? Because um, if you don't have a victim, how can you um, have a crime? Okay. So when he got off, you were like, that's what I thought. I mean, I just was like, you know, hey, you know, I, you know, I tried to help. I did my part. I, I'm trying. I've always been out trying to raise awareness. That's what it's about for me. Like I said, I when she said it wasn't her, when I knew her family went out of town, you know, I pretty much knew what it was going to be at that point. Okay. And then R. Kelly goes on with his life and goes on with his career. And, you know, he's not at that same level anymore. Right. But he still has a catalog of hits and still touring and everything else like that. Did you maintain any sort of contact with him after the trial? No, none at all. Okay. So that was it, you know. And, and during this time, based on what we saw on the in the documentary, he's now bringing in other girls and and kind of doing repeating the cycle all over again, and. What I find kind of interesting, because I was talking to someone about this, is that you yourself, were you ever an aspiring singer? No. No. But but a lot of the girls that were ended up being around him were. Yes. And the only singer that I've ever heard R. Kelly put out was uh, Sparkle. Mm -hmm. And Aaliyah, so, I guess, right? And Aaliyah, right. right. But this is the 90s. like. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're talking about you have these, like, promises of making you a superstar but this hasn't happened in like 20 years yeah and so. i mean the group talent he had they were really good you know i just hate that he really didn't do anything with them because they were awesome yeah so okay. he doesn't okay. really uh i guess he kind of feeds people dreams yeah which is sad so years go go by and you know, people in the industry like myself had always, even before the trial, we had heard all the rumors and everything else like that. And then we heard more rumors after the, afterwards. But things were relatively smooth for R. Kelly until the docuseries came out, right. which you were actually in yourself. Yes. Um, were you at the, at the initial screening when the, the gun threat came in? Yes, I was. Okay. 
Was that actually scary for you or was it kind of like, okay, this is just some R. Kelly bullshit once again? Um, we were kind of surprised at the the length we felt like someone associated with him went went to. But, um, you know, I, I can't say I was really scared, honestly. Okay. And he tried to stop that, the docuseries from coming out. Yeah, that's pretty much all it was. Right. But it, it didn't stop it at all. And oh, no. it, com- it comes out right. and it's like the, the biggest thing <laughs> of 2019. Right. Yeah. Lifetime was ready for him. They, they weren't going to stop. So this thing comes out and it's huge. And, uh, you know, he's obviously denying everything and, and so forth. Um, and everyone's, you know, seeing what's what's going to happen. And suddenly all these new charges came up. I think it was uh, 10, 10 new charges. Yes. OK. And then, you know, before then, I mean, Sony ended up dropping him. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of shows got canceled and so forth. But, you know, that's all small change compared to 10 new sexual assault charges. <laughs> right. <laughs> when you heard about these 10 new charges, what'd you think? Once again, I wasn't surprised because, I mean, I know, you know, his his background. I know, you know, what that he likes young girls. I know that he likes to tape everything and record. And, I, I mean, you know, I know these things. So, I mean, at some point, something's going to get out or misplaced or someone's going to talk. Okay. And along with these charges, there's two or three new tapes that have surfaced. Yeah. When these charges came down, were you asked to cooperate at all? Um, I really can't talk on that right now. <laughs> okay. Because no. it's still an open case. Right. Mm-hmm. Got it. Got it. I'll take that as a strong maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um. And, uh, well, R. Kelly gets arrested. You know, when, when you saw the, the footage of him going to the courtroom and the mug shots and everything else like that, how, how did you personally feel? Well, I just felt like he needs to uh, get all his affairs in order for a long stay. Well, I guess that his financial situation was so bad that he couldn't even make bail himself. Yeah, you that's know? what I heard. Yeah, I mean, I, I would imagine how many payouts has he done? Over the years? Goodness. Yeah. Have you seen Cook County's records of all the payouts? Yeah. Extensive. Yeah, it's, quite, it's quite a bit. Right. And, you know, and those are just the is... ones we know of in the court, with the courts. <laughs> so. Right. Right. Yeah. And this to the point where he, he couldn't come up with $100,000 himself. And I guess a, mm-hmm. a suburban woman in Chicago actually put the money up. Yeah. Something else, right? It Something ends up else. being a woman helping him out. Well, there was actually a GoFundMe page. Like females, like his female fans were starting a GoFundMe page to try right. to bail him out. But I guess it got shut down. Uh, That's crazy. As well. GoFundMe said, no, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's pretty It's pretty crazy. Um, so now he's actually out on bail and awaiting his trial. Yes. And your prediction when he actually goes back to trial is what? Um, I, like I said, he better get ready, get his affairs in order for a long stay. I definitely feel like they have a strong case this time. I just, you know, him saying it's not him. I don't see that being enough by, by far. Well, you yourself, uh, are putting out a book. Yes. Is the book out yet or no? Yeah, you can actually go ahead and pre-order it. It's on um, I am Lisa Van, Allen, Van Allen.com. That's my website. But yeah, okay. it's called and Surviving the Pipe Piper. Okay, why that name? Uh, it's multiple reasons. Um, one, for obvious reasons, he calls himself the Pipe Piper. Um, he likes underage girls. A lot of people don't put that together. Uh, the thing of um, him calling himself the Pipe Piper and it actually meaning, you know, the Pipe Piper took children away from their families. So, you know, I thought that was pretty fitting to what went on, you know, with the underage girls or the young girls. Well, when you met him, you were 17. Yes. 
and even though that was technically legal, mm-hmm. I was in still that a child. State, you were still a child. Yeah. But you continued a relationship with him as you got older. Yes. You're 18, 19, 20. Like, what was the 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 oldest you, age you were while still dealing with him? Um, actually, that that 2007, like right before the trial, right before I dealt with him about the tape. We had. So you were um, how, how old at the time? Um, 26, 27, something like that. Yeah. An adult with with your, with your own child at that point, you're a mother, Mm -hmm. you know, when you look back on it, how much responsibility do you put on yourself and say, you know, yes, he did, you know, here are some things that he did wrong, but here are some of the things that I willingly participated with and I have to take responsibility for myself. I mean, I take responsibility in all the things I participated in other than the incident where he did not disclose her actual age and he didn't allow me to make my own decision on whether I would wanted to have sex with a 14 year old. That, that was not what I consider as my fault because if I didn't know, how do I know that she's uh, 14 if he tells me she's 16 and she didn't say anything other than that. So, you know, that would probably be the only sexual situation that I would blame him for. Right, because you know, in terms of the pedophilia stuff, right. I'm I'm a hundred percent against that, and all everything he's convicted for in terms of that, I feel right. that he should be put in jail for the maximum amount of time. Um, you know, in terms of women who got involved with him, especially you know, you were rather young, but there was women in that documentary who were in their twenties and thirties and stuff like that. Do you? feel sorry for those women or do you feel like well they're adults they already heard about r kelly's reputation already so it's really on them personally i feel sorry for anyone that was abused so if he did abuse them then i do feel sorry for them in that way because i mean you can be manipulated i mean he's he's really good at manipulating you and making you do what he wants you to do and talking you into situations so you know, I, I can honestly say I, I do feel sorry for even a grown woman if she was uh, abused. I interviewed a public announcement mm-hmm. and uh, your name came up during the interview. So I, I just want to play you just a short clip. Now, Dre, you said that you've seen Lisa Van Allen around a lot. Mm-hmm. Okay. And you said that she was doing crazy stuff. Yeah, I think this was when she was grown because around the home alone time, if you research this, I wasn't in that video. So this is the time she say she met him. So I think maybe, I don't know how long it was after that, but then, yeah, then I came back around and then I seen her around. And, you know, she was doing her, you know, she's doing her thing. I I mean... I mean, to the point where, <laughs> where I mean, dude is, <laughs> it's too late. Dude is very like, you know, he wanted his way. So I, I, I just tell you one thing. Um, we sitting in the studio, you know, and they got the console thing in the middle, the couches on the back, big board in front, and all of a sudden she would just walk in with like just some panties on and stand in front of the board and just stand there. Okay. So that's the light version of it. She might have a top or whatever on, but just standing there, like, you know, whatever. And okay. for for all of us in there to pretty much view, it was that type of thing. Okay. But, you know, for some people, they need candles and stuff like that to set a mood, so... This is just common practice. It's standard. Come on. You know that. It became normal. That That's kind of normal okay. for the lifestyle, you know, that I <laughs> See was See the in. look on his face? <laughs> it was normal. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. You know, this was not any sort of crazy revelation or anything else like that. It's just describing uh, a time. Did you, did you see, uh, uh, you know, the guy that was speaking? Yeah, that you know, was Dre. But, I mean, what he's talking about, I know what he's talking about, is pretty much Rob would tell me beforehand to do to put on something specific and then walk in the room. So, yeah, I know exactly what he's talking about. So it wasn't okay. like I was just like, ooh, I'm about to go walk in the room. No, 
It wasn't like that, you know. Okay. But so, I mean, so, he left out the part though where Rob wouldn't let them speak to me, or I couldn't speak to them, or couldn't nobody even look at me and things like. He left that out. Like he may have looked, glanced, but then he know he would turn his head straight the other way. So he left all that out. Well, no, they, they talked about that. You know, they said that when R. Kelly's women, like including his wife, would come around, they would not be allowed to talk to her you know, look at her, whatever. And that kind of applied to any woman associated with R. Kelly. Right. Okay. So, so that story was more or less accurate. Right. I mean, but he didn't really even yeah. say anything, honestly. Other yeah. than, you know, I came in there for Rob in my underwear with a shirt on. And then he tried to justify me being underage when I met Rob by saying he wasn't there, but he came later. So... And to be per to be fair to me, honestly, when he did come around, he still doesn't know. I still was 17 when I was in Chicago until, you know, I turned 18. So, yeah, you weren't at the Home Alone video. But when I was in Chicago, I was still 17. Got it. You know, so now you have a, a daughter that's in high school, right? She, yes. she was actually on uh, on Red Table Talk. Yes, she with, was. Uh, with, with Jada. You know. As a, as a family, having, you know, you being in the documentary and your daughter being in high school and being on social media, I'm sure, and, and, and so forth, how has this really kind of affected, you know, your home life? Um, it's affected it, but at the same time, you know, we, we were kind of prepared for this, you know, like I've kind of gradually, you know, I dealt with a little bit, bit back in 2008. So it's not totally new to me. So, um, you know, I talked to my children, you know, so that this none of this was like a surprise. So, um, you know, she may have kids at school ask her, oh, I saw your mom on TV or, you know, do you think that's OK, this or that or things like that, you know, every now and then. But she's a really smart girl and she knows how to handle herself and and she knows all about everything. I'm I'm very open and honest with her just like I am with you and everyone else. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, she was crying on yeah. uh on Red Table Talk, so right. obviously it does affect her. Well, yeah, you know? she was she was crying because she she knows what I've dealt with and she's she's feeling, you know, for me she's like people you never know what others are, have gone through, you know. You know, um, I think I, I was talking to Linnell about this, and she made an interesting point that she feels that R. Kelly ultimately got off on that first trial because the girl in the video was black. And ultimately, all of the women that R. Kelly was, was dealing with were, you know, young black girls. Had you taken that same situation and put in a young blonde girl, you know, they came from a middle class uh, home, you know, there's actually something called white girl syndrome, you know, in the media that, that shows a dis disproportionate amount of media attention uh, goes to young white women of a certain, you know, uh, financial level than goes to other other women. Do you feel that... Being being a black woman and having everyone else in the situation be black women also is the reason why it, it went on for so long under the radar. Yeah, I mean, um, I do. I agree with that. Okay. You know, and music has had a history of this type of thing. Uh, I mean, Jerry Lee Lewis was married to his cousin at like, she was 13 or something of that sort. Uh Elvis Presley was married uh, to, uh, you know, Lisa Marie Presley was very young at the time. Um, you've seen it, you've seen it over and over again. You know, do you feel that, you know, if, if R. Kelly goes to prison, uh, that it'll send a, a message that this type of thing won't be tolerated anymore? Hopefully that's the goal. You know what I mean? The goal is for, you know, everyone to be held accountable for their actions. Um, it's also to get a message message out there to people in power, not just musicians, just anyone that thinks that they can pay off people and get big lawyers and get away with things. Yeah, it shouldn't be tolerated and it won't be. You know, you and R. Kelly haven't spoken for many years. 
if you were to walk into the room right now and, you know, have a conversation with you, what would be the thing that you would tell them? Um, probably to send those girls home. I'd probably tell them to send them home. And if they want to come back, let them come back on their own. That's probably all that I'd be willing to discuss at this point. Because I just don't understand why he won't just let them go home if they'll come back on their own. Well, you know, you were in a similar situation. You're talking about the two girls. Um, was it Jocelyn Savage? And Azriel, yeah. And, and Azriel, right. You know, you were in somewhat of a similar situation. Did you ever feel like you were trapped and couldn't, couldn't leave and couldn't go home? I didn't feel like I was trapped, but he did make it kind of difficult to just up and go. Like he, he'll make you miss flights. Um, he'll do things like um, not get on the phone. You know, if it's a situation where you want to do something that I, you feel like he doesn't agree with. Or I, it got to the point at one time that I had to start making up emergencies for reasons why I needed to go visit someone. Or I'd always have to have a really good reason why I needed to do certain things. So, yeah, I can understand why it is difficult for them to get away. And if you, you know, they probably don't want to upset him. And, you know, they do, I'm sure they do care for him. So, you know, they do probably want to be there at this point. So I would say, you know, they're going to have to get tired. And, you know, everyone does that on their own time. Other, but other than that, I would say, if he, you know, if he, even if they don't want to leave him, if he could just let them go home for a weekend or so, see their families, because that's all their families want is to see their children. And if they say, you know what, mom, I'm going back because they're grown, they can do that. You know, I don't see well, how that, that, I don't see that as being far-fetched. Yeah. I mean, you know, you mentioned the families, you know, a lot of people have looked at this situation and said, okay, everybody knows about R. Kelly's history. Everybody knows about the trial. Everyone knows about the Aaliyah story and so forth. Mm -hmm. How much responsibility would you put on the families of even bringing their young daughters in the vicinity of someone of an R. Kelly with this type of established, you know, reputation? Um, well, you know, me personally, I wouldn't send my daughter. But um, from what, what I'm saying, right, from what I've heard because I, you know, I've spoken to the savages and they're really good friends of mine. Um, they really didn't follow the trial much. And, you know, when they, what they did know, you know, it wasn't really clear, especially since the girl was saying it wasn't her. So, um, you know, even though we're good friends now, I guess at that time, they probably didn't, didn't really believe my story back then. But, um, you know, I, I think the fathers thought that they had more control than they did. And, um, that's ultimately what happened. They thought that they could control the situation and always be there. And it just so happens that they weren't able to do that because he already had in his mind of how he could get around that because he's been doing it for so long. Right. Well, I mean, this trial is going to come up sooner or later unless yes. he pleads, unless he pleads out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I can't imagine a plea deal because you know, there is no slap on the wrist plea deal with this many charges. Right. So. And I mean, this I'm, isn't I'm, the first go round either. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So so my guess is he's going to take it to trial. Yes. And, and we're going to ultimately see what happens. And he'll have his day in court, as will everybody else. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. I think that with these many you know, and I've interviewed a lot of people around this and so forth with these many stories and these many videotapes and, you know, and when you cross check the facts and, and the stories and everything, it all pretty much lines up. I can't imagine him walking away from this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't I don't see this going very well for him. But I mean, it's about time that he's held accountable for his actions. I mean, I, I get bombarded with emails and uh DMs and all these things. Um, my um, my entertainment manager, it's Pelican Gang Entertainment. They get so many emails all about all this stuff and girls talking about things that have to do with him, girls saying things that did, didn't have to do with him, uh, situations where they've gone through abuse. I mean, it's it's crazy. Like, it's just, ugh, you wouldn't understand. I mean, it's so much. It's a lot. Well, 
Mm-hmm. Well, but even even as he's leaving, you know, after he pulls Bond and he leaves and goes to McDonald's, yeah. girl girls are still bombarding him and want to take yes. selfies and so forth. Yes, his, you're right. His black female audience is is something on an absolutely other level. Mm-hmm. You know, it was like that during the first trial, right. and it seems like it's, you know, still going strong. But the sick part about that is you said he was at McDonald's taking pictures with black uh, girls, right? Mm-hmm. Wasn't he told when one of the stipulations not to be around anyone under eight, uh, under 18? And he yeah. went straight to McDonald's. I'm sure it was someone under 18 there. <laughs> I'm sure. <All> right. <laughs> So, I mean, he could care less about, uh, you know, he does pretty much what he wants to do. And, I mean, they allow him to get away with it. But hopefully at trial, it'll be a little different. Yeah. I mean, R. Kelly is kind of very, very different in the way that, you know, he just pretty much puts everything out there. You know, it's yeah. like, the, what, what was that song? I Confess? I Confess. What, I admit, Where, the last one? I, I, admit. I, I admit. I admit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I yep. admit. On that song, he actually, uh, I think he cussed me out a little bit on there. He said something about... um. I think he said, bitch, I bought you a car or something like that because he brought me a car at one time. So, yeah, he, he got a little rude. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, <laughs> did that bother you at all when you, when you heard that? Not really. I mean, he did buy one, so no, didn't bother okay. me. But, what, um, what, kind of car, huh? what kind of car What kind of car did you get? It was just a Ford Mustang, but it was a new one at the time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's kind of fly. You right. Know? Yeah. Kind of fly for a teenager. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Listen, uh, Lisa Van Allen, I definitely appreciate you coming in and telling the story, you know, and, and you've told your story before on different platforms, but right. I think this is going to be special in the sense that you get the whole, the whole story from beginning to end yes. without it having, you know, interspliced with other people's story and so forth. Right. This is actually the Lisa Van Allen story, which mm-hmm. I think is a very important story when it comes to R. Kelly, who, you know, you know, regardless of the accusations, is going to go down as a very important musician right. of this era. Yeah, you, you can't know, take that from him. I mean, he's no. he's retarded and he likes underage girls and he's a pedophile, but he is talented. But a lot of those talented guys are kind of weird. Yeah. You know, so. But Absolutely. he still needs to go <laughs> to jail. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah, and, and that's probably going to happen. Right. You know, and, and ultimately, you know, I, I, played you a, I played you a clip of the public announcement uh, interview. Right. Uh, but, you know, I'm not sure. I don't think we put this part out yet. But, mm-hmm. you know, when I asked them if the, the docuseries was accurate and based on their, you know, what they've seen and experienced, is it, you know, believable? And they said, ultimately, yes. From your point of view, as group mates with R. Kelly, spending a lot of personal time with him, everything that you've personally seen, do you feel that surviving R. Kelly was accurate or very one-sided? Well, I would say that it was pretty, pretty accurate. Pretty accurate. And and I'm going to say that in terms of um, most of the women that, that spoke, those survivors, they, you know, I believe they were telling the truth. You know, the power of the documentary it could really right. change the uh, the direction of, of things. Yeah, it was powerful. So, yeah, that was very well done. Shout out to Dream Hampton. I think she did a good job. With yeah, that. she did. So Lisa Van Allen, uh, thank you so much for coming in. And we'll have links to your book, you know, in the description. So, uh, you know, everyone should go and buy it. Do you have an audio book version or no? Yeah, there's that. Well, it's no, it's the digital and the paperback. Okay. You should do an audio book version. That's actually how I read all my books. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'll look into that then so we can get you a copy. Do you want a paperback copy too? Sure. Send it over. (laughs) Send it over. Awesome. Thank thank you so much for, you know, for coming in and and good luck with everything, you know, and, uh, you know, my respects to, you know, your family, your daughter and and so forth. And, uh, you know, it seems like you've gone through somewhat of a healing process by actually getting the story out as well as helping a lot of a lot of people that have probably gone through something similar. Yes, I do. I try to help out. And you know, I I always take pride in just being very honest, you know. Yep. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you coming in. All right. Thank Peace. you. Thank you for having Peace. me.